Welcome to episode 9 of the Wild World Podcast. I'm your host Thomas from the Wild World YouTube channel and joining me is my co-host Mika. Hi there, hope you're enjoying September. On this podcast we talk about wildlife, paleontology and cryptozoology. But first, Mika has some random tidbits she wants to bring up. Hi! Um, okay, so I actually wrote down these notes two podcasts ago after we finished recording, mm-hmm. but then I forgot about them last time and they've been burning inside, you know. So, number one, about pandas and bears. I was talking about how, like, the whole revelation about pandas eating meat changed my life, sort of. Um, They might be eating the wrong kind of bamboo in zoos as well. And I forgot to mention another aspect of this, which is that when I was younger, I read in a book that pandas weren't classified as bears, more like a type of raccoon thing. Since scientists thought really? they had totally, yeah. Um, I don't know how old this book was, by the way. I had a very big blind spot when I was a kid, and I thought everything I was reading and consuming was from the same time period I was from. So, like, I thought mm. Roald Dahl was still alive. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just an example. So, these books might have been really old, but anyway, the book said that pandas were classified more as a type of raccoon rather than bears because they have totally new, different nutritional needs, and the only reason they looked like bears was convergent evolution. That's what the book said. Mm. However, because of the revelation that pandas go for the highest protein types of bamboo, um, it's been found that pandas actually eat the same amount of protein as any other kind of bear. It's not a problem anymore. It's not a classification mystery. Pandas are just normal bears. Does that Fair make enough. sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, also, on that episode on Cryptid Court, we talked about the beast of Bladenborough, and we were talking about what animals it could be, and I think I forgot to say another theory, which is that it could be a black bear, which could explain some of the weirdly malicious behavior, mm. um, like the bikes getting destroyed. Like, it doesn't have to be a kind of cat, right? you know, um, or a dog. So black bears are pesky fellows, and they like salt, so they would attack a bike to get at the salt. And they also like causing a ruckus. Fair enough. So Beast of Bladenborough, potentially a black bear. Yeah. As well as all the other things that might have been. Yeah, like a mountain lion or... Yeah. Okay. Um, Jaguar. Anyway, uh, now we can move on and talk about what's been on our wildlife radar since the last episode. Okay, um, so I haven't seen too much wildlife lately. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been trying to observe the prairie dogs by my house, but there's not much to observe. Like, if you get up close, they hide. And if you stay away, they mostly eat and look around, which is, I mean, there's not really anything interesting. The babies are grown up now, so they're not as cute. There's just, it's just, they're just prairie dogs. (laughs) But in media, I was watching season two of Sweet Tooth, a show you don't like. Um, it's a show about a pandemic and nature fighting back with human animal hybrid babies. Um, so I really liked season two in comparison to season one, and it got into the types of animals that have hybridized with humans and their different abilities and quirks. Like there's a bird kid that is a perfect mimic of sounds, and there's a monkey kid with a prehensile tail. And my favorite is a gopher kid yeah. who is good at digging, and he's very smart and cute. Um, not too much for me either. I uh, haven't seen a whole lot of things. There's a bunch of sort of large-ish house spiders that have seemed to start living around my desk and curtains. So that's interesting, I guess. You're attracting them. I already told you this, but I named one of the big ones that likes to patrol the curtains, Gabe. As a reference to Gabe from The Office, because every, t- every night when he comes out, I am always surprised because I always forget. <laughs> I just see something darting around on the curtains. Like, oh my god, what the heck is that? Yeah. It's just a spider. Scary. You're starting down the path of being like a vampire or a ghoul because your house is going to be covered in um, cobwebs. I'm already and stuff. a ghoul. Man. <laughs> I'm gonna, I might show a picture on the screen of what the spider looks like. So if you're an arachnophobe, Maybe don't look at the screen for the next three seconds if you're watching this on YouTube. But yeah, not not a whole lot. Um, I guess we could just jump right into the news, maybe. Okay. So do you want to start with your story about the eels? Yeah. So there's a new species as of May <laughs> um, of moray eel that appears to be losing its eyes. It was discovered in a cave system on Christmas Island, 
and Panglao Island in Australia and the Philippines. And some of the eels have skin covering the left eye, which is evolution in progress because they don't, lots of animals that live in caves um, are blind, you know, and lots of animals that don't live in caves aren't blind, but there's never, we never really seen another, like a transitionary species before. So, yeah. Is it still an eel? What do you mean? Is it still an eel? <laughs> what? Well, you said it's evolution in progress, so. Yeah, it's progressing to an eel that's blind as compared to an eel that isn't blind. Uh, that doesn't sound like evolution to me. Okay. <laughs> then you're stupid. <laughs> I'm, I'm just doing a bit. That is pretty cool. <laughs> um, That's what they'd say, though. People didn't believe in evolution. They're like, oh, well, it's still an eel, though. It didn't evolve into anything new. It's just losing information. It's evolving into a blind eel. Which is something new. Yeah, losing information. Does that mean that a, a cow can turn into a whale? <laughs> no. Checkmate. <laughs> I don't understand. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, that is pretty interesting. And it's only the left eye, is it? That's what it said. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Does What's the name of the... Does it have a... Have they named it yet? Um, It's called... Rop... Pterygius siamomatis. Does that mean anything? Maybe. Matis means I oh. in Greek. I don't know. Probably. No. As you call it, the Cyclops eel. So it only has one eye. That right. Works. Yes. Or the um, pirate eel. Yeah. What a missed opportunity. <laughs> so how about you? What's your news? Um, okay, so I'll go on to my news story is a little bit about dingo cullings. Or, well, yeah, I guess you could call it that happening in Australia. So there was new research that came out that um, suggested, or not suggested, it showed that um, dingoes are actually mostly genetically pure. So apparently before this research came out, a lot of people thought that dingoes were mostly hybrids with like, I guess, feral dogs. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing, the important thing about this is that dingoes are currently treated in some areas as wild dogs, meaning that they can be hunted as wild dogs and captured as wild dogs. And the scientists think that government needs to make some changes about this saying that there could be some ecological risks. But then there's also the, another aspect to this is the cultural risks or the cultural side. So uh, many First Nation people in Australia aren't happy with the killings of dingoes in the different national parks as well. I think 20 representatives from 20 different First Nation groups signed um, a petition that lethal control should never be an option because it seems like the dingo is very um, spiritually significant. Yeah, especially now that it seems like they're pretty distinct from your regular feral dogs. Um, and I guess the scientists and the First Nation people are trying to come up with, or trying to implore the government to come up with better policies to control, try and control the population rather than hunting and killing the dingoes. See, this is interesting because um, I guess the propaganda or whatever it was did come to me because I thought that dingoes were feral dogs, like like dogs that were brought by Europeans and have gone wild. Um, but then I went looked into That's it. That's what I thought I was, for years. Yeah. yeah. I looked into it and they are not brought by Europeans. They're most closely related to those singing dogs from New Guinea. And it seems mm. they got there independently about 4,000 years ago, which is way before Europeans came to Australia. Yeah. Admittedly, they are very new additions to the ecosystem because it's only 4,000 right. years. But they've been there forever, and they've definitely integrated into the culture, um, the Aboriginal Australian culture. So it's not like they're just some random thing that needs to be destroyed for the environment, like rabbits or deer or whatever. They're yeah, they're definitely native Australians. So it changed my opinion, or I didn't really have an opinion, but it made me realize they're not dogs at all, even though that's what some people say. Yeah, or at least most of them are. Uh, genetically pure, I guess is the term. So I guess a small percentage. Yeah. 
And I think it used oh, to be... That's interesting. I can't remember the figure, but they used to think only 4% were genetically pure, but I guess that was yeah either mistake or propaganda or something. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, it doesn't really seem like there's two sides to the story, in my opinion. It seems like there's a good reason not to treat them as wild dogs, and there doesn't seem to be a good opposing... Yeah, uh, like, they're not really an invasive species, like I used to think. They're actually good for the environment because they're the only predator, pretty much. And I was wondering, what was it like 4,000 years ago before they came? And it seems that was the thylacine. So yeah. without the thylacine, dingoes are the only predator that's keeping things in check. Yeah. And they target non-native animals as well, which is good. Mm. Like cats and, well, it's sad, but <laughs> they target animals that are bad for the environment. Right. Yeah, so I guess this is... Um, possibly potentially optimistic news because at least now there's a lot of people who have um, who are trying to stand up for the dingo and have you know they have the science and evidence to back them up so hopefully yeah. there'll be some change to policy I guess. I hope it works out but it seems that it is um, what do they have in Australia provinces or states? Well, <sighs> Maybe anyway, both I don't know. It's it's uh, segment by segment <laughs> makes the law so Australia yeah. doesn't like not every part of Australia is as progressive as other ones so I'm not sure yeah. what happened. And then there was that weird thing in the state or province of Victoria, I don't know, where it was like dingoes had some form of a protected status but wild dogs didn't. So this is a yeah. weird middle ground where if it was considered a wild dog then it wasn't protected or something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was a bit interesting. Um we can move on to some more positive news now, though. Okay, so more news about new species. Um, this is about some new spider species that were just discovered, and they were named after Star Trek characters, mm -hmm. specifically Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. They are from, let's see, Brazil, I think. And it's interesting. Um, sorry to cut you off, but was it they said that they named them after that because they are the scientists? Was it Doctor Baldano or something? Said that they looked vaguely like Star Trek ships. Oh yeah, that's why. Oh, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, which I don't really see, but it's fine, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and so basically, science uh, spider scientists are big nerds. They love sci-fi and stuff. And um, They're it's very common. Cool. Yes, it's common for new species of spider to be named after, well, not just sci fi, but pop culture things. Yeah, there, wasn't, there are three different ones named after David Bowie. Yeah, there are spiders. There, no, there's a genus of spiders, uh, 54 different species named after David Bowie. Wow. Now, spider scientists are cool. They're into some cool stuff Star Trek and Bowie. And spiders. <laughs> There's a spider named after the Roadrunner called Strotarchus Beep Beep. That's pretty good. And there's um, a Myrmecium Oompa Loompa. So I was wondering, like, what are some of the interesting spider names you've heard of? If you've heard of any other ones. I'll put maybe on the spot. There's huh. a chicken spider. Well, it's in the notes. If you'd read the notes, you would know I was going to ask that. Uh, hold on a second spider? now. I saw you editing the notes as we were speaking, so I don't remember that being there. I didn't edit that in. Let's see if we can chicken find Chicken spider, you say? Yeah. Probably not a scientific okay. term, but that's what it was called by locals. It was a tarantula in the Amazon that would basically attack local chickens and stuff and, like, drag them away. It was very and hungry. it lived in family groups. Yeah. I'm trying to see if there are any, like, lists of funny spider names. Well, maybe if you read the notes beforehand, you'd be prepared. I would just thought you might have an answer for this, maybe. Like, I don't know. It's okay if you don't. It's fine. No one's going to get mad at you. I found a list of scientific spider names. Um, they don't look that interesting. So, oh, wait, there's, sort of, there's one that's sort of interesting. The Pamphobedius mascara. Like, is it named after makeup, or is there is a, does mascara mean something else? Who's to say? 
I guess uh, we'll never know. I'm looking at it, and it has, like, black sort of hairs. Uh, yeah, it's called the Mascara Bird Eater. Could be. Could be an interesting name. There's also... I mean, most of these are just normal names, like after people or something. Oh, there's one that's called Pumpkin Patch. That's its common name. <laughs> pumpkin Patch. That's pretty cute. And then there's another one called Large Pumpkin Patch. That is cute. Just keep an eye out for interesting scientific names. It's always a good hole to fall into. Mm -hmm. That's about all I have to say about that. But I think your next article also is related. Yeah, I just... This isn't a big news story. It's more just like an interesting tidbit, but it came up recently. So I wanted to just mention it since we're already talking about spiders. But another uh, spider w was recently discovered because a lot of spiders are discovered every year. Um, a tarantula with a very cool like electric blue color uh, on its like front legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of a blue violet color. It was discovered in Thailand. Yeah, it's very, it's, I guess it's just interesting because it's so unique. There's not too many other spiders with the blue color and, or tranches with the blue color. And all the ones that do have it seem to have evolved it independently. That's cool. Yeah, and it was found in some mangrove forests, lives inside hollow trees. Yeah, I just thought that was pretty cool. It doesn't have so, a cool name though. Hmm. Or maybe it does, but I'm too dumb to understand what it means. Uh, let me see, let me see. <laughs> it's Chylobrachis natanicarum. I don't know what that means, sorry. But, okay, so it's interesting. Yeah, just... When you talk about new spiders being found and named, uh, apparently there are 51,000, more than 51,000 identified species of spiders. And it's estimated that yeah. there are 150,000 or more spiders in the world. And... So that means like there are so many more to discover. Um, about 1,000 species are identified each year. So if you love naming things, that's the field for you, potentially. Yeah. That's, and I've heard different figures about that. I heard from like the World Spider Catalog or something that there was another 50,000 instead of another 100,000. But either way, there's like a lot, basically. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, I think that you're right. It'd be a good a good field to go into if you wanted to name an animal, I guess, or discover a new species. Speaking of, today for Wild Chat, I thought maybe, since we were talking about all these new species that were recently discovered, maybe we could talk about, I guess, if you could discover a new species of animal, what would you choose and what would you like to name it? So I said I'd want to discover a predatory mammal, such as a cat, like a small cat, because those are rare to discover these days. Those are about the rarest um, yeah. new species to discover. Like everyone's out there discovering new frogs and new spiders and new bacteria, but that does not, well, bacteria aren't animals, but anyway, that doesn't interest me, okay? <laughs> I want to discover something really cute like a cat. And then after I discover it, I would want to name it whatever the native language of the area calls it. So like if they have a name for it, that's what I would call it. And if we can't find out, I would name it after whatever it reminds me of, like a celebrity, like if it looks like a celebrity or a mythological figure or a friend, okay? And then if I keep discovering animals because I'm very lucky, um, pretty soon I'd name one after myself, but I don't want my first one to be after myself because I don't want people to think badly of me, you know? Yeah. Would you use your, um, would you use your first name? Oh, yeah, my first name for sure. I don't think my last name is very nice. Interesting. How, how about you? I mean, I'd probably just go with spiders since that seems pretty easy to do. So you're going the easy, easy way. To do. <laughs> you're you're, going going, you're reaching way. not for the stars, but you're reaching for something attainable. I'm reaching for what's attainable. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but I, I, you know I like spiders as well. Yeah. I mean, it would be cool if it was like a large tarantula as well. I think naming it if it has a local name is nice. I think for spiders it's a bit different though. I mean, like animals that are bigger are more likely to have a local name, but spiders, since there are so many of them, you know, maybe the name will just be spider. They don't yeah. have, maybe they wouldn't distinguish between, but who knows? Yeah, maybe not. But if, So what would you name it if you couldn't find a local name? I guess I'd probably do something similar to you. I like the idea of doing it a celebrity that it reminds me of. 
or maybe even a character mm-hmm. it reminds me of. <laughs> yeah. So. So I'm pretty sure, or maybe I'm just imagining this. I think that both Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield have spiders named after them. I feel like I've heard that. Oh, or maybe not. Yeah, but I don't think Tom Holland has one. So you could be the one to name, you know, the spider after him. And he'd be so grateful. <laughs> what if I just called it Tom and it was ambiguous which Tom? Oh, right. Yeah, that is good. That's good. Could be Tom Hanks for her. Or if you discover a genus of spiders, you could call them the Tom genus. You could call the like the Tom genus and then every species name could be a different Tom. Yeah, they could be the Cruz, the Holland, the Hanks. You're going to get on... Getting good with so many different um, toms if you go Really? This way. Would they all become best friends with me? <laughs> you could have a little party. <laughs> yeah, you could have a party to announce the, the new spiders and you can invite all the toms and they could come and... Yeah. Uh, That's a good yeah. um, piece of advice. If someone out there really wants to meet a celebrity, <laughs> they should travel to uh, some remote place where they're likely to find new spiders and then name a spider after that celebrity. They won't mm-hmm. be able to resist you then. But first, they have to become vi- experts in spiders because it. How would they know if it's a new one if they don't already know I all suppose. the other spiders? So, <laughs> first, get a PhD in a in arachnology, then um, get do a postdoc if where you can learn to identify a bunch of spiders, and then get funding to go someplace and look for new spiders. Oh my god! So it'll only take about twenty years. And make sure that you choose a celebrity who isn't too old, because you never know <laughs> if you'll do it in time. Right. Well, I was saying you could also just hire someone who's already gone through that process as your guide. Okay, but then you're just you're stealing the discovery from them. <laughs> yeah, you might have to knock them out when you actually discover the spider. <laughs> Pull a um, Professor Lockhart thing from Harry Potter, the second one. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's all a ruse. Okay. Yeah, should you move on to the next section? Okay. Well, first. So so next is Cryptid Court. And before we go on to our creature of the episode, I want to address a bit of a controversy that came out on the community page with a survey for this episode. I should have anticipated the controversy, but I didn't fully understand it at the time. So I just want to go okay. over why we made the choices we did today. Um, right. So the cryptid that won the poll... Is a very famous one. It starts with W, if you know, you know. And it's considered by mm-hmm. many native peoples of North America to be a taboo to mention. So we won't hear. Mm-hmm. I knew about the taboo, but I figured if we talked about it tactfully and just debated it as a biological creature, the same as any other cryptid we discuss, it would be a good debate and it wouldn't be offensive, you know. Um, but there are many, sp- and there are many spiritual and religious beliefs with scary or taboo creatures. And from a scientific perspective, I don't feel the need to avoid talking about something just because it might be evil or it could hurt me. For example, we talked about the Sigvin, which is also a figure in spiritual beliefs, even though it's definitely not as dangerous. Yeah. However, the larger issue here is that if the creature is if the creature is even a cryptid that can be debated. And after looking into it further, I concluded it isn't, and that treating it like a cryptid is where the insensitivity often lies. Um, So cryptozoology is about non-human animals that might actually be real, but just haven't been proven yet. However, this creature is as human as you can get. It is the embodiment of human greed and evil, and it is both a symbol and an evil spirit. So debating whether it is really out there, as if it were Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, would be like if we decided to debate whether the devil or God are real, um, which would definitely be inappropriate and outside of the scope of this podcast and biology. Plus, it takes away the whole meaning of the myth if we attribute the evil behavior of this creature to animals rather than to humans, who we all know can be very evil. You know, because animals aren't trying to be evil. That's just the way they are, rather than humans who can be considered evil, I suppose. So another thing is that this creature has been misrepresented in media and turned into an animal-like creature that it is not, just to provide some entertainment in horror movies and video games. For example, it doesn't have deer antlers, despite all the pictures that show it with deer antlers. Right. So if a native and a member of the tribes where the myths originate wanted to do a piece on how it could be considered or explained as a cryptid, I'm sure that would be interesting, but it is not on us to decide that we think it's a cryptid. 
And we don't want to be another out of touch creator who misrepresents the true meaning of this mythological creature and act like we know more than the cultures from which it comes. So um, that's why we were doing the second choice on the poll, which is the Beast of Dean. Okay, so I guess we'll just move on to the cryptid we're going to be talking about, the Beast of Dean. Otherwise known as Moose Pig. Yeah, so uh, this week I will be arguing that Moose Pig was indeed a real a real creature. And I guess you'll be obviously arguing that... Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure what you'll be arguing. You'll be opposing my position anyway. Yes. And whatever you say, I'm against it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I guess I'll just uh, read from the show notes. This is so. This is something from uh, Gloucestershire in England. The Forest of Dean. In the Forest of Dean, and this originally, this uh, story comes from 1802. So, but basically, there was a large creature that somewhat resembled a boar, but I guess the descriptions were way larger. That was operating in the area and knocking down trees, and being a nuisance. I don't think it harmed anyone or there's any mention of it harming anyone. But um, either way, eventually some local hunters from the village of Park End managed to capture and kill the creature. And the line you'll get on like all the cryptid websites is that upon examination, all agreed that their prey was no boar they had encountered before nor even any familiar indigenous species. Uh, after this, in March of 1807, the sighting stopped entirely for nearly 200 years. Although I guess there's rumors that it may have escaped after it was captured and wasn't actually killed. Because there's some kind of rumors that people heard the grunts and the roars of the creature even after it supposedly died. But we don't really get any other clear sightings until the 1990s. I think the late 90s from uh, two men who were going through the forest and they heard loud crashing and roaring. And a big shape chased them out of the forest. The forest of Dean that is. Where to begin? Well currently... I guess we'll work backwards. I think we might agree with the 1997 sighting that it might have just been one of the wild boar that inhabit the area, mm -hmm. right? Because there are boar in the forest of Dean today. I, I guess it's a group of wild boar that escaped from a local boar farm and then another group that were illegally dumped near the forest that merged together. So that might explain any sort of recent enough sighting or anyone who heard something weird in the forest. However, if we go back to the uh, 1802 sighting, there's the line that they all agreed their prey was no, po no boar they had encountered before. Well, they shouldn't have encountered any boar, really, because boar had been extinct in England for apparently three to four hundred years. So there shouldn't have been an, any boar there at the time. So that I think the conclusion... F that I draw from that is that though the boar may have thought to have been extinct, perhaps there was a very small population of particularly large ones that I guess lasted an extra century or so. And that one of the last survivors, I guess, was this beast of Dean that was tearing through the forests. So what are you, what are your thoughts? Um, so I agree that it doesn't seem that there is a beast of Dean nowadays and any sightings are just the easily explained group of wild boar that escaped from the farm. It seems that these boars were also hybridizing with farm pigs, getting bigger and being less mm -hmm. afraid of humans. And so actually there were some people who said that the they should be slaughtered, but the forestry commission said the low population density of the boar is good for the local environment and you can cull them, but you know it's not necessary to get rid of them all. So it seems right. that there's just a self-sustaining wild boar population now. About the Beast of Dean in 1802 through 1807 and possibly after, uh, I'm less sure. But what gets me is that they said, the hunter said, their prey was no boar they had encountered before, nor, or, nor even any familiar indigenous species. But I couldn't find any description of what they found. Why would they be so vague and not even describe it? Unless I can't 
find yeah. it and it is out there. Like, why are they being so vague? And then how come no one knows if they captured it or if it escaped? How come there aren't any drawings or pictures? How come we don't know what happened to it after they killed it? That's just sketchy. So it seems fake <laughs> to me. Possibly they didn't even capture anything. They just said they did because, like I said, it's very weird and vague. And maybe there was something in there that was big. Or maybe it was just some guy like illegally chopping down trees because the description is noises and trees that were coming down. So maybe it was some guy who shouldn't have been in there cutting down trees and the guys, hmm. who the hunters for clout. Well, I guess if they're saying, I guess I am suspicious of the quote. Like I said, if there were no boar there for at least 100 years, then why are they saying, oh, this doesn't look like any boar I've seen? Well, you shouldn't have seen any boar at all. So yeah. It's sketchy. I'm just, I think that for his clout, they pretended like they captured something that they didn't. And no one apparently was curious to find out what they captured. And that's it. Well, I mean, I sort of, I can see that they just captured and killed something. And then like, I, I, I could see that not being that big of a story and that no one came to take sketches or anything. Mm, well, I feel like if they captured it, they probably killed it. I can't imagine they captured like this wild or you know what it could be? What if it was just, you know, the way like when pigs go like escape into the wild and they go kind of feral? Yeah. I wonder if it was something like that. I guess so. But then why would they say it was no boar they'd encountered before? I'm sure they know what a pig looks like. Well, it wouldn't have looked like a regular boar, right? Okay, but there are, either way, whether they caught something or not, they're being um, disingenuous. <laughs> oh, we caught something. It was like no boar they'd encountered before. So either that means, oh, we caught a pig, so it doesn't look like a boar, or we didn't catch anything. Ha ha. That's how, <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think there's any possibility that it could have been one of the, the few surviving boar, maybe, in, in the wilds of Dean? Um, well, if I'm not speaking from my viewpoint of the anti-person, I'll say I guess it could be... It's very interesting to think that it could be a wild boar population. I always want to root for the animals that have survived despite intensive human efforts to get rid of them especially in places like England, where it's pretty much not at all the ecosystem it used to be. Um, yeah. So I would be excited if that's what it was. Yeah. I'd be excited if that's yeah. what it was, but um, who knows? I suppose. I do feel like... It could have just been a big um, elk. Or, I mean, not an elk. It could have been a big deer that was just top, like toppling trees or something. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say that... Um, oh, yeah. I feel like that in the early 1800s it would probably be easier for uh, small populations of animals to exist on the fringe without people knowing than it would be today so yeah maybe it, maybe it could have been something like that yeah well we'll never know because even if um, these hunters hadn't been sketchy now that there are so many pig boar hybrids out there they might have hybridized with the beast of dean and then yeah we'll just never know unless someone does yeah. a genetic study of the pigs in the forest. I feel like now there's no, like, imagine someone saying, I saw the Beast of Dean now, and it's like, well, you saw a boar. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's like freakishly gigantic or something. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They're probably going to hybridize, so the big ones will become smaller, and the small ones will become bigger. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing is, I'd never heard of this, but I had heard of the Forest of Dean, because in Harry Potter, they hide in the Forest of Dean for a while. <laughs> Do they? But there was, no, yeah, they do. It's in the seventh book when they're hiding from, they're they're camping out all the time because they're on the run. At one point, they go to the Forest of Dean because Hermione used to camp there. But she never talks about pigs and also no other characters. There's no mention of pigs. So missed opportunity. I think, yeah, it could have been fun to have like this huge creepy boar thing come across their camp. Yeah. Yeah. One shame. All right. Well, that was a very um, amiable cryptic court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So if anyone has any ideas about this or if you're from England. Oh, yeah. Some people commented area, that they lived in the area, actually, on the poll. What? Yeah. Wait. Oh, wait. What did they say? They said, oh, I live around there or something. Did they say um, if they'd seen it or not? No. Oh, well, that's sort of not helpful <laughs> yeah but if they're if if they're watching this now they'll 
Yeah, if you're listening, please weigh in and tell us what you think about our conclusions or if you have your own ideas. Right. Hey, the beast of Dean. Uh, should we move on to the next section? So Q&A. If you want to send in any email to us, you can send it in at the wild world podcast at gmail.com. That's the wild world podcast at gmail.com. Yes. So we have a message from Dan from the UK. He says, hello, Thomas and Mika. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Question for you. If humans went extinct for whatever reason in a million years past, what animal do you think would take our place? Things to con- consider. Because your chosen animal make its way all over the world and survive in all climates as we have. Is there enough of your chosen animal to become dominant compared to others? And would mammals stay on top or would something like birds take over? Hope this is a good question. Interesting. I feel like a million years is a long time, but maybe not long enough for certain things to happen. Mm. Like well, I couldn't imagine like another age of dinosaurs happening if birds took yeah. over or something like that. So I was thinking um, probably the most likely reason that humans would go extinct would also result in many other animals going extinct because yeah. uh, our biggest threat, existentially, I would say, would either be like nuclear war or just general environmental degradation, both of which would mm-hmm. totally destroy many animals. So I, if humans are going extinct and it's not due to a human-specific pandemic or something like that, then I would say mammals would also go extinct such as, you know, anything that's similar to us or anything that is more sensitive than us, like marine yeah. mammals and big predators and animals that sort like of... ungulates and stuff. Yeah, I could see a lot of... Or if they're climate sensitive, which is a lot of animals as well, I think a lot of them would get would be gone. as, And that would apply to amphibians and probably reptiles. Basically, we're some of the most resilient animals. So if we're going extinct, we're bringing a lot of animals with us. Yeah. But some creepy insects on the other hand. Yeah. I was thinking insects are the big, it's going to be an age of insects after us. That's what I was thinking as well. Because if like global temperatures rise, they'd love that. Mm-hmm. And then if like, I was thinking if there's like an increase in CO2, then humans go that maybe there'd be a, a burst in like more plant life and foliage mm-hmm. and, and algae increased in the temperature seas. and it would be sort of like um what like those dioramas from before the dinosaurs maybe carboniferous or something yeah there were like these thinking. huge animals and all this all these plants everywhere yeah or not huge animals I meant huge insects. Yeah, because if yeah. there's more plants and then more oxygen, that's why they were able to get so big back, yeah. in, back in the day. Yeah, I could see some specific animals, mammals staying, and perhaps they would be the um, top uh, the top smart ones in the world, such as rats. I could definitely see rats surviving um, the human apocalypse and being the top of the intellectual food chain. I'm not sure what they would do with that power, um, probably just eat all of our trash because we we're going to have a lot of it after we go extinct. And after they eat all our trash, I guess they're going to probably get bigger. But I don't know. I'm not going to say that in a million years, there's going to be a rat based like like a rat society <laughs> world because they're not going to they're not going to um, evolve or differentiate that quickly. So be able to change too much in a million years. Yeah. Um, an animal life. Well, I feel like if the algae is growing on the ocean and stuff, uh, maybe lots of fish and other animals will go extinct, but I'm sure there will be some resilient ones. Who knows? But also, we're just sort of assuming that this is climate or environmental degradation related. So what what if we look at it as humans just randomly disappear and it doesn't, like, everyone, every other animal is exactly as, as it is now? How would that be different? Like, right away, it seems like every other species... That isn't a domesticated species would benefit yeah. almost like instantly. I wonder um, what would happen if climate change would reverse itself at that point, or if it's like too far gone unless we do actual removal methods of CO two and stuff. Like I wonder if it would still hurdle towards a similar conclusion, or if oh, all humans just disappeared now, everyone would be like, "Oh yeah, it's great again," and then the climate would stabilize or something. Well, I mean, I. I... I imagine it would probably stabilize quickly enough if there's like no or very like not the same amount of CO2 being dumped. And then I imagine plant life would start to spread. Yeah. 
I because this is pretty much like the concept of that show life after humans or something like life after people uh mm. so the first episode it shows all like the domestic animals getting out and the smart ones um like the smart dogs make packs and the stupid ones just die sadly <laughs> <laughs> um and then there are like elephants roaming if my dog would join a pack <laughs> your dog uh here's your dog is too stupid to find his own food i'm sorry but <laughs> he would not he would be too sad as well like some dogs i feel like are more likely to um adapt to life without humans and other dogs are just going to be sad you know what Poor i mean guy. Oh. well so anyway the first episode is all about like these animals escaping or dying um that are used to humans so taking care of them like Elephants roaming the plains of North America from escaping from the zoos. Like, that would be interesting. But then... Huh? Yeah. Huh? Like, I'm not sure what... what... No, that would be interesting. I just, I just don't know how they would have escaped. I feel like they'd just all die in the zoos, though. Um. Yeah. That. However, if all the, like, electricity goes out... Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's not Jurassic Park. If just humans were gone, I don't know what animals would dominate. It's... I would say it would be animals that are already dominating, like coyotes, rats, animals that are really good at urban environments, because it's not like the urban environments are going to disappear. The same habitat threat problems are going to remain, and so the animals that have gotten the best at exploiting those habitats that we've created are the ones that are going to continue exploiting like the rest of the world. So coyotes are probably going to be a really big threat to birds and things all over North America, foxes. Uh, raccoons so it's almost like the monkeys in asia hmm? the medium to small uh omnivore mammals will prosper the most yeah so i guess in answer to the question if only humans disappeared for some non-environmental or disaster related reason probably mammals would stay on top until yeah, they were on top before tips, humans yeah the only thing i think that would change and make another like sort of life form be on top would it be a climate related change because otherwise it, the climate is still favorable for mammals i would say right i think it's a good answer um by the way i just want to correct myself i said the mammals were here before us i know we are mammals too i just mean other mammals were here yes that is true <laughs> okay what i'm hoping um, is like well i was hoping some animal would become our intellectual rival right after us and i don't know what would be the best candidate for that dolphins octopus uh, yeah i don't know because there's nothing <laughs> to say it has to evolve towards human intelligence either though that's true yeah right so thank you dan for your question um we didn't really answer the other things to consider could your chosen animal make its way all over the world is there enough of your chosen animal to become dominant uh well for insects there are definitely enough yeah but and also, what do you mean by dominant? Huge. Like, well, I think um, he's referring to like age of reptiles, right? Age of mammals, age of insects. What would be the age? So I feel like, um, so. By your answer, it would still be the age of mammals, just with humans removed, right? Unless, mm -hmm. like I said, it was a disaster-related death of humans, and was changed in the age of insects. Yeah, and there are definitely enough insects to become dominant over others. Because yeah. insects are the ones that aren't dying. The other ones are the ones that are have to die because we're dying. And then the yeah. insects, like, they'll just get big. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of our Q&A. Uh, lastly, I have one comment from YouTube today. So please tell me what this is from. In the book of Prophet Enoch that was omitted from the Bible by the Catholics, it describes that angels fell to earth and made children with humans. The children were the Nephilim, giants that everyone has been seeing in mountains. Can you guess what this is from? No. Okay, I'll give you one last sentence. God changed... God changed... No, I can't talk. God chained those angels underground and made the females into sirens. Okay, is this from the mermaid video? Yes. Uh, which was interesting. First of all, I wanted to know if this is true. Is that true that there's a book that is omitted from the Bible by the Catholics and describes the stuff about Nephilim and angels and sirens and stuff? Um, I do know that the book of Enoch is omitted. Is it only by the Catholics? I thought it was, there was no like, I thought it was just considered not to be scripture. Well, it's interesting because I've heard of a lot, a lot of things that have been omitted from the Christian Bible. 
such as the story yeah. of Lilith, who was supposed to be Adam's first wife. And I have heard about Nephilim in yeah. like sort of sci-fi fantasy. And I'm sure it came from someplace, right? So uh, I think Nephilim are in the original Bible as well in a different book. Oh, okay. Well, I just don't know anything about the Bible, but is it true? I mean, I like I said, I've heard of the Nephilim. And I guess they're saying that Nephilim are like Bigfoot or something. <laughs> and then why would he make all the females into sirens? Or I just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Is this like real or uh, I don't know. How real is this? I, I don't know. I've never read it. The thing is that I'm wondering though, is that sirens originally, the Greek sirens weren't mermaid like at all. They were. Yeah bird women oh they were sort of like angels because they had angel wings and all that so i wonder if, if if this is like an ancient greek translation or something and then uh, because we're looking through a, a modern lens we see the word siren we think mermaid but, but i don't, I don't I think don't there were much. angels in ancient greek angels are more of a christian thing yeah i know but you know the way like early versions of the bible were um like some of the books were written in ancient greek but i don't know i don't i don't really know much about it yeah well okay but it's an interesting idea that the giants in the mountains are actually Nephilim and that the sirens aka, or mermaids, whatever this person means, are the siblings of the giants. And also, yeah. for some reason, the giants are chained underground. Uh, it's God is... I don't know why he would make that decision. Like, why would he chain the angels underground? And then why would he make the females into sirens? Why not just chain them all underground? Or He works in uh, mysterious <laughs> ways, Mika. <laughs> so that's the comment for today i thought it was interesting yeah all right well thanks a lot for listening or watching the podcast today i hope you enjoyed it if you're watching on youtube feel free to give it a like um feel free to share it around to all your friends and your enemies <laughs> why know. why would they share it to their enemies well if they hated the podcast and like this is terrible it's the worst thing i've ever listened to share it to your enemies then punish them right <laughs> and everyone wins all right, any final words? Please keep learning more about wildlife. I don't know. Yeah. If you live near the Forest of Dean, feel free to email us or leave a comment telling us if you've seen any of these boar. And if you know about the Book of Enoch, please explain to us. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure. Okay, thank you. for. Thanks very much for watching or listening, and we'll see you next time. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.